right. Good morning here once again, Sunday morning. And it is March, when is it the 26th? March 26th. Um, and we are in the middle of the book of Galatians. Um, last uh, section of last paragraph or so of chapter 2, and maybe we're going to get into chapter the first um, nine or ten verses in chapter 3 this morning. God is good. Let's open up with uh, prayer as we give this time to the Lord here today. Father, we're grateful again, Lord, to be your to be your children, your sons, first and foremost, Lord. And we, we belong to you and we're your uh, household and you've chosen to make us that and because of that, we're members of one another. We're grateful, Lord, for that, that we're not in this race alone and we're not in this journey alone, but you've given us uh, the body of Christ, Lord, to um, not only to represent, but to... Uh, uh, but to be um, vessels and vehicles of your love to one another, with one another, and for one another. That's just an experience that goes way beyond um, description and comprehension. And that's, we're so grateful to that, for that, Lord, uh, because of you and your presence that's with us when we're gathered together in your name. We're grateful for that. We're grateful for Christ, who is the one that sought us, each one of us, by your intention and by your good will and your plan and your purpose from ages past. You knew us, even then, by name, and you called us. We're grateful, Lord, for that. We're grateful, Lord, that Jesus went, Lord, and uh, that he left that throne in glory and came into this existence where we were in darkness and you brought us that light and the knowledge of you. We're grateful, Lord, for that. We're grateful that we're not left to ourselves and neither do you every day, Lord. You remind us of your presence, the sufficiency of your grace, that you're all, all, you are all of our all in all, all that we'll ever need. And we pray, Father, that um, as we grow in you, grow to know you better, it's more that it's just what more that we want more of you. We ask that you'd uh, speak to us, draw us closer to you in your words. In your words are life, there's spirit, and there's truth that liberates and sets us free. We just ask, Father, we see more of Jesus today and see what you're, what you're doing and see your work in our lives. See your work in the life of your church and be all a, a part of what you'd have us to do today, Father. And equip us to be your servants as we go out from this place and uh, represent you into the world who is lost and needs to know you. We ask this, all of this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 All right. Um, let me go back to this one more time, picking up where we left off last week. Um, you know, we're talking about that uh, for us the Christian life is is not a changed life, it's an exchanged life. Um, but before we do that, I'm gonna go ahead and read the, the last portion of chapter two again. Um, I'll pick up in verse 15 to 21. We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith, in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law. Because by observing the law, no one will be justified. If while we seek to be justified in Christ, it becomes evident that we ourselves are sinners does that mean that now Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, I prove that I'm a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, 
but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me, gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. So, now that 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 little argument there begins with we who were Jews by birth, okay, physically, we're Jews physically. He's about to make the distinction, though. By the way, that a Jew is not one who is one physically, but a Jew is one. A Jew is not one who is circumcised in the flesh. A Jew is one who has been circumcised by God in the place that is uh, deeper than the flesh and where the flesh can't go, the heart, circumcision of the heart. And that's, and that's what uh, makes one really a child of faith, a child of Abraham. He's about to go there. Uh, but, and at this point, so, he's did, so what, makes, what, what what's, makes the Jew any better or gives him any more advantage than a Gentile who doesn't have the law of Moses, doesn't adhere to it, and he's basically saying, as far as relationship with God, there's nothing, there's no advantage. Because the one who's a Jew by, by physically, by physical genealogy, has the same problem as the Gentile who has no law. And that is, um, there, and, and this is the, 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 the way he starts this, this case, is that we who are Jews and have the law, and we were recipients of uh, God's choice. God set us apart. He redeemed us, took us out of Egypt, made us his own, gave us his covenant, gave us a land that we could call our own. He became our king when, when all, we didn't have a king like any of the rest of the nations. We had him. We had his presence in the Holy of Holies. We had all of, all of this stuff. And yet, that allows us to know more than you Gentiles that keeping the law doesn't justify it. We who are Jews know better than anybody else that keeping the law won't justify a man. So he's using his Jewishness to make the point that Judaism won't save you, won't save a man, because it doesn't change man on the inside. All it does is change him a little bit on the outside. Say like you know you can you can dress up a pig in the with and put a tuxedo on the pig, but as soon as you let him outside, he's going to go straight to the mud puddle, right? Because he's a pig, and they like to wallow in the mud. It feels good to their to their bodies, it cools them off. And that's what they do, and that's what our old nature does. You can dress it up, and you can put a tuxedo on it, or you can put priestly robes on it. And uh, and send them into the into the temp to, to the, the temple, uh, but inside there, that's what Jesus said. That inside of you, uh, behind all those robes, whitewashed sepulchers and dead men's bones, right? Because that's all you're doing is you're putting something on the outside. If you're not justified on the inside and you haven't been made new on the inside, so what what well the the argument Paul is making is that. If we have an advantage for being Jewish, it's that we know that we're sinners. We, we have the knowledge of our sinfulness, or we should, more than you Gentiles do. Because we've had, we've had the revelation of God, the history of God being with us, to know that we are a bunch of flawed people who can't keep the law of God, and it's impossible. So we know that... The man is not justified by observing the law. If anybody should know that, it's the one who's had the law and has been laboring under the law for their whole life and their whole history. A couple thousand years of it. But exact, exactly 2,000. When you think about it, John, uh, Abraham lived about 2100 B.C. Uh, and uh, died around 2000 B.C. And then 2000 years, about, and then 1000 B.C., there was King David. And you had uh, uh, the, uh, the monarchy through David and that Christ would come through the king. And then 1,000 years later, Jesus is born from the earth. So you had 2,000 years of Hebrew history and 
Abraham being the one whose name Abba means father, father of those who, who believe, the father of the faith. And Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him or charged to his account as righteousness, but it was by his faith. And that's, that's one of Paul's favorite verses, Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness and he believed God long before there was a law of Moses. More than 600 years before Moses. And his faith was what justified him before God while there was no law. And so, um, so does that mean that, that God justifies people without law so we don't need law and so that you can do whatever the heck you want to? He asked that question there in verse 17. No, no, it's not where we're going. In fact, if you're justified, if you really have justification, you don't want to do the things that displease God. It's a matter of, you know, if, if it's a matter of relationship, and relationship has to do with sonship. It was it the, the, the um, those of you who were here last week that the message that I spoke from that Michael Reeves book on uh, the Trinity, uh, the Father and the Son, and the relationship that was based, and without, if if God would have been like any other of the pagan gods. Who, is, who just had power and authority, but no relationship, he would be what he calls a divine policeman. That you do, as long as you keep your nose clean and stay out and stay on the good side, you're fine. And even if you do uh, transgress and he happens to look past that and forgive you and let you off the hook, you have reason to be grateful to the divine policeman, but you still don't love him because there's not a relationship there based on love. But God sends his son into the world and he says, this is my son whom I love. Hear ye him. There's a relationship there and it's the relationship of sonship that makes you want to do the things that honor and please the father. Then, and that's what the son did. He came to do not his own will but the father's will. And he's looking for sons, other sons who will do the same thing. So what the Jews did not have, as much as they gloried in it, boasted in it, was sonship. And here that was that's their boast. Even to today, we're the chosen people. What does that mean? Well, it should mean, and it you know, theologically and biblically means he's our father and we're his sons. They have no con concept at all. They call themselves bar mitzvah, which is means son of the law. Com yeah, the commandment, literally. The mitzvah. So yeah, it's on, it puts places you under the law. We're sons of the command uh, of the commandment. Um, they would have been much better served to say uh, son, sons of the uh, ketav, which is the word for covenant. Um, you know, or uh, because God gave to Abraham a covenant. I'm going to give you a nation, which is a posterity, and the and all. All nations on the earth will be blessed through you, Jew and Gentile. It does not just your posterity. All nations will be blessed through you because Abraham walked with God, a God that he couldn't see with the eyes but had a relationship with as a son. And, he, and that, that was a relationship based on faith. So... What we have today is a relationship with God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ who we saw in the flesh but came to know in the spirit after his physical crucifixion, his burial, his resurrection. We didn't just know him anymore according to the flesh, the carpenter's son who taught us good, wonderful things and, uh, and, exp and, and turned all the Pharisees uh, interpretations upside down and on their head and now we you know now we can really understand what what's going on in the scriptures instead what they saw when they saw him they were looking into the eyes of the eternal God that understood and he and he could give light because he was the light he was the truth so he comes and and uh, 
does what the law could not do. Romans 8, 2, and 3, and love that, that passage, I always go there. For what the law was unable to do, weakened as it was through the flesh, that God did. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and on account of sin, he thus became, he thus uh, condemned sin in human nature, so that the law's requirements completely would be met by us who walk no longer according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That's what God did. He now dwells within man, even though man, the man who's, who was and is a sinner, he, he makes his home in that person. And it, that happens not by his, the man's efforts, it happens by the finished work of the son who completed the whole work and now he charges that sinner's sin to his account and charges his righteousness to the sinner's account by the simple act of receiving it by faith. Now that's an offense to those who are perishing. It's an offense to those who are religious, who, are, have, to, who have to be told, sit down and stop trying to do good things. And by the way, it doesn't look so good when you're trying to do them yourself. Right. You know? <laughs> it don't look as good as you think it looks. <laughs> because it's always, in, a, in the end, going to be some way self-serving, because it's me and my efforts trying it's to like do it. The older brother said that. The older brother syndrome, you know, and that was a, that's a good that's a good parable that really does show, like we talked about this a few weeks ago, how the older brother re really was representative of the Jew Israel, the younger of the Gentile. Remember, one one brother says, "I'll I'll I'll do your will," goes his way, doesn't do it. The other brother says, "I don't want to do that. I got other things to do," and he goes away and thinks about it. What's more important than doing what my father wants and pleases him? And the younger brother goes and does it. So the younger brother does the will of the father. The older brother gets jealous of that and jealous of the relationship that the younger one has. And that's what Paul says that, that we as the church do. We make the Jew jealous because of what we have that they don't have because of outward uh, ceremony and religion and all the outward efforts. I have been crucified with Christ and no, I no longer live and Christ lives in me. So the life that I'm living in the body, in the present tense, I'm living by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And I'm not setting aside the grace of God. Grace is um, God's riches at Christ's expense. It's having received everything, the uh, the, uh, the the status of sonship. I, I became a son because Christ was the son, and I have and I have entered into His relationship with the Father by faith in Him, and that includes the full rights of sonship, and that includes all the inheritance that belongs to it. Everything that God has, Jesus has. Everything that God is, Jesus is, and everything that Jesus it has. We have, and we have, um, now, we have his, uh, his complete, he, you know, in Christ, the, full, the fullness of the deity dwells in him bodily. Now, we don't, we can't say that we are deity in, by our nature, but we have the one living in us who is fully deity, the fullness of uh, uh, the, the uh, the divine nature, it lives inside of us, Paul makes that uh, argument in Colossians. So that, then John can say, the one who lives in you is greater than the one who lives in the world. Why are you worried about him? <laughs> as long as you're fighting the battle, on, on, as long as you're trying to fight the battle and fight the enemy, you're fighting that battle on, hit on the enemy's terms. But if you're standing in the Lord Jesus Christ and your faith remains there, you have a part in fighting the battle. It's the, and the only part of it is, is whose uh, authority you're going to stand on. And I'm going to fight this battle on his term, God's terms, not my own. Because he's the one that justifies, and he's the one that defeats uh, the powers of darkness, and it's his light 
uh, that saves us and has brought me into, into his light. So the exchanged life. Yeah. Now, it just so happens that uh, this, this past week, I just happened to be in the book of Romans and say, man, I gotta, go. I gotta read a couple chapters here. This is exactly what, 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 Paul, uh, what, what Paul's saying here in Galatians chapters two, three, and four, he expands on more in Romans chapters two, three, and four, and five. It, it's, and and, and uh, uh, it just, so I'm gonna go and, and, uh, and turn to Romans, turn to Romans chapter two, um, and it brings a whole nother light on this topic about um, grace through faith, justification, not by the works of the law, but by faith. And, um, and, that, and the, the implications that has for my life in Christ. It has every, it, this isn't just so that you can understand the four spiritual laws and how you're saved. It has everything to do with how you live your life and how you walk. Right? Like, uh, I've been, I've been, that, <coughs> that saying that uh, Debbie that you said last week um, has been, as I've been reading the first uh, half of the book of Romans this past week, has been in my mind all week because uh, <laughs> you said uh, <laughs> something that, Something that Neil said that we, we must preach the gospel to ourselves and all the time and every day. Pre you know, we and we do. I got to preach the gospel to myself constantly, daily, to, to 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 remind myself not only that I'm saved and why I was saved, how I was saved. Yes, I gotta I gotta take that stake and stake that in the ground, and I'm not, not I'm not I'm not giving any ground on that. As soon as we start to fight and start to try to defend ourselves. No, I wasn't wrong. I didn't do that. You know. You, you know what? You're. You're. Here. Here we go again. We're trying to defend our actions and ourselves and justify ourselves. Doggone it! I'm already justified. I'm. More, I'm going to proceed from the position as one who is already justified and redeemed. And my um, defense is not in who I am. It. My defense is in. Is in uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and to, and to make Him known who he is and what he has done. That's our calling, to do that. And, uh, and it changes how I live and why I live. As long as I'm living for, for Christ, and, I'm my, and, and that's what motivates me and calls me, uh, there's only one enemy I'm going to have. The God of this world, the prince of this age, and all those who are allied with him that are trying to advance that. And those... Uh, People who are enemies of the gospel are exactly that. They are under, uh, they're following their master and their Lord. Oh man, wouldn't you, wouldn't you, uh, wouldn't you have, what, what would you have felt if you had been there and heard Jesus call the Pharisees, the leaders of the Jews, you are of your father the devil and you're doing his will. You know, and here they were, the ones who, presumed themselves to be represented, representative of Yahweh, the God of the Jews. And he's telling them, he just, I mean, that puts it as clear as the conflict, black and white as ever before. You're not doing God's will. You are doing the devil's bidding. You are, and you're of your father, the devil. That's why you can't do anything but the devil's will. If you believed Abraham, if you call yourself Abraham's children, you do, you do what Abraham did, and that was to believe God. To put your faith in the, all, the one who only can justify. So that's the problem with religion. Religion keeps more people away from God <clears throat> by its actions uh, than it can bring people to God. If it's talking about, and, and that's a, really a good criteria to, to you know, we talk about how, how, how do I know to work? You know, if you go into a different town or different state and you need to find a good church to go to, where do you go? Are they talking about what they're going to be doing for God and who they are and what they want to do and the glorying and uh, the fact that they've got several thousand people there? And, or are they talking and mentioning 
centralizing on the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ and exalting him and who he is. It's all about who he is and what he has done. And there's a place for my testimony, for your testimony, but your testimony is always going to, is always going to uh, minimize yourself and maximize and glorify the Lord Jesus because of who he is and what he has done in your life in spite of me. And the more you talk about him, the less you're going to be having yourself in the focus. And that's, that's a good way to, um, you look at, uh, just put, you, nowadays you can pick up any church on your, on your phone, on your internet, and just listen in and see how much of it is Christ-focused and Christ-centered. And whether, how much of it is, is focused on self or the generation or the style of music or this or that. All right, let me have a couple of people who want to read. We got, we got, um, let's see, we've got 20, let's see, let's go ahead and read this section. Chapter 2 in Romans. Somebody read the first 16 verses, and then somebody read 17 to 29. What's that? I read last week, teacher. <laughs> All right, Kathy. I'll read, read John. Her, I'll read the first 16. And then John? I'll read 17. Uh, okay. You, therefore, have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere man, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you toward repentance? But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will give to each person according to what he has done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law, and all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. Since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences, consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts now accusing, now even defending them. This will take place on the day when God will judge men's secrets through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares. Okay, beginning in 17, verse 17. Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, <clears throat> if you rely on the law and break about the relationship to God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior, superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of infants, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. You, then, who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? 
you who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who brag about the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Circumcision has value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. If those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you, who even though you have the written code and circumcision are lawbreakers. A man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart, by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from men, but from God. Now flip over to the end the book of Galatians, the very last chapter, chapter 6. And uh, just verses 12 to 16. And Lucy. Okay. Those who want to make a good impression outwardly are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised obey the law, yet they want you circumcised that they may boast about your flesh. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, even to the Israel of God. Finally, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear in my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, brothers. Would be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. Okay. Circumcision nor uncircumcision, either one means nothing. Uh, because it has no bearing on your relationship with God. Neither one can keep you uh, from God if God justifies. Neither one can uh, bring you to God uh, if it's not God that justifies. Does that make sense? Circumcision. So religious observance, and that's what circumcision is all about. If it's just you trying to do the commandment, do it because it's a commandment, and do it because you want to keep the law, that in itself will not justify you any more than somebody who hasn't had the physical um, operation, nor uncircumcision, neither one. Uncircumcision won't keep you from God if God justifies you. And circumcision won't justify you if God hasn't justified you. So, peace and mercy to all who follow through and even to the Israel of God. Whoa. You mean there's an Israel besides the, the, na the physical nation Israel? There's an Israel of those who, which includes Jew and Gentile who have been circumcised not with human hands. One new man. That's what Harold spoke about uh, yesterday, was the one new man. The one new man, yes, right, one Gentile, new man, yeah. which includes Jew, both Jew and Gentile, whom God, those whom God is, who has circumcised in the heart, so it can't be done by human hands. And that happens through the receiving of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son, coming into a person's heart. And then you become named as a son of Abraham. So if you're a son of Abraham, 
I'm part of Israel. The real Israel. Now, um, now you could ask the question if you're Jewish and you're part of a Messianic congregation, well, what does that mean for the, the nation Israel, the physical nation Israel now? Is God done with that nation now? Mm-hmm. Guess what? We have Romans 9, 10, and 11 to answer that question. God is not done with that nation. He's going to gather them back together, graft them back in like a broken off branch that's now grafted back in the vine. And um, he's not done the promises of that, and that will all be glorified. And those who then became jealous will, will um, then serve him. And uh, when they see him, mourn for him as one mourns for an only lost son. This is a non sequitur, but how do people justify replacing the theology? Yeah, yeah they just um, refuse to take literally um, anything that has to do with the future apocalyptic literature. It, it just it's it's all to be taken at allegorical because it's symbolic in, in nature and this and that. So um, and they'll argue with you. It's silly because if you understand hermeneutics, which is um, uh, the principles that we use in Bible interpretation. Um, A metaphor is a metaphor. Uh, A parable is a story set alongside of a a truth. Not everything in the parable is relative to uh, the real life situation, but the truth is, well, these things, when Jesus told a parable, you could see that. And and, uh, when he told parables, the guilty knew that he was talking about them, especially the Pharisees, when he was telling the story. Um, but they say, uh, like it says um, in uh, uh, when you study hermeneutics, you can't make you don't you can't make a parable walk on all fours. In other words, uh, unless unless Jesus, like like in the parable of the sower of the seed. Now this. This ground means that guy. This type of ground means that guy. This type of ground means that guy. So I uh, have to see which type of ground are you when you hear the word and the seeds planted. So, so, um, but when you talk about prophetic utterance towards nations and history, and this is going to happen, and that's going to happen, and he gives specifics to numbers of years, to the n- names nations, names kings. Uh, you got whole chapters like Daniel 11, mm-hmm. Daniel 10 and 11, and into 12, where he talks about the whole, from uh, the history of the Greek Empire and the Roman Empire, and names all these things, the kings of the north, kings of the south. Here's a battle over here. Here's what's going to happen there. These people are going to win. And you look in history about three or 400 years later, and you got the Ptolemies from the south and Egypt and the solutions down from, from the north and the Greek and they're fighting against each other and it hap- and it pans out just exactly like Daniel saw in his vision. So you have this prophetic, how do you not see that and not say that these things that are written beforehand uh, and that Cyrus, king of Persia, would be the one that would release the Jews to go back from their captivity in Babylon to their homeland back in Israel. The guy wasn't even born yet when Isaiah made that prophecy, and he named his name, and uh, and it happened just like that. And, and it's, so you've got so much in there uh, where history is pre-written. So why, how, and why can't you say that uh, this is where all of these things were happened and were written beforehand? Here's the way it's going to happen. Christ is going to return and, and at the end, set up his kingdom on the earth. And here's, by the way. How are you going to know that? Because here's what's going to happen in the seven years just prior to when he returns. Time to the Gentiles, a man of sin, setting himself up to be worshipped in the temple. The whole world coming together as one nation to do this, to make war against Israel and Jerusalem. All this stuff happening together. And uh, and we're not and we're to say that's just allegorical when everything else... Can, you can put yourself... You can write all that stuff that happened that was prophetic and you can... And you can put the church, here's the church, here's where we are, here's what happened all before, here's what's yet to take place. And just like that map when you walk into the mall, you are here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
you know, and so I know where to go. You know, you know, if you're going through a, a biking trail in the mountains, you need those maps once in a while. You know. Is there a left or a right in this fork in a road? Circumcision or uncircumcision? Uh, I wanted to go back to. Are we doing on time? Ten minutes. Romans uh, two, where he um, really uh, explodes on this, and then uh, let me go into uh, chapter three a little bit. So. We're back in the book of Romans. So what advantage does the Jew have over the non-Jew? Which is just the word for Gentile. Gentile is just a non-Jew, a non-physical Jew. Or what benefit then is circumcision? Okay, well it doesn't, well we just read in Galatians 6 that circumcision has no benefit in terms of producing righteousness in a person. Does it mean anything? But what really means is circumcision of the heart, a new creation. Uh, but what does the Jew have any advantage then based on that? Well, Paul in Romans 3 says yes in, in, uh, in a number of ways. First, they were entrusted with the spoken words of God. What then of those who do not believe? If some did not believe, will their unbelief cancel God's faithfulness? Absolutely not. God must be true even if everyone is a liar, even if they choose not to believe uh, what God promised. And they were talking about promises in the Old Testament that you may be justified in your words and triumph when you judge. But if our unrighteousness highlights, I, I, I should mention to you, I'm reading from the CSB here, um, which is uh, the Christian Standard Bible. It's a newer translation. And uh, it's a little more fluid. I liked, I read this, I just, it just happened because I read this, uh, I read this book this week in, in the CSB, and it just was, um, it's a good um, translation from the Greek, um, good scholarly work, uh, a little bit different than the NIV, the wording, and maybe a little bit more <coughs> uh, conversational. But I liked the way I liked what it did here. You know, when, when we're getting when we're into the deeper theological explanations of salvation, and that um, sometimes uh, sometimes a more conversational um, translation will help you understand the argument and, and bring what's going. Then then bring that back to the more literal translation. And help, let the literal translation help you understand the conversational translation <laughs> about what's behind it. And the conversational translation, if you know it's a good one and it's not a paraphrase, not the living, not the good news for modern man, though, those might have a place too, but very, very minimally. And if, if I'm reading to a five-year-old, maybe, that's, by the way, by the way, that's what uh, Kenneth Taylor wrote the Living Bible for he was reading the Bible to his children, and he didn't. And it and it just the King James version just didn't cut it. You know they were. You know can we have our um, can we have our orange juice now? <laughs> uh, so he he started translating the Gospels uh, in a paraphrase, and that's what it's called a paraphrase. It's not a real translation at all. For his children, so there, and that, that's that's what the paraphrases are for, uh, for kids. But for adults, um, a good you need to have a translation that's based on the Hebrew, the Greek text, to get what it, God's saying to us, and, which is going to be lost in the paraphrase. Uh, but if you have a good translation that's based on the text, some are more conversational than others. Um, sorry about that, I'm getting off on a little aside, but. <clears throat> this one came open to me when I read um, the book. The, the a couple uh, several years ago, I read the Berkeley version and really loved the Berkeley version in, in Romans. And I chose to memorize Romans six, and Romans eight, Romans six through eight out of the Berkeley version because uh, the, some of the wording there was just really brought it home. But uh, the CSB in Paul's letters is really good. The ESV also is good in Paul's letters. 
although it's um, reformed and Calvinistic, so be careful with the footnotes. <laughs> That's, um, but anyway, uh, if, if our, on, uh, back in verse 5, if our unrighteousness highlights God's righteousness, what are we to say? I, I use a human argument here. Is God unrighteous to inflict wrath? No, absolutely not. Otherwise, how will God judge the world? But if, my, if by my lie God's truth is amplified in his glory, why am I also judged as a sinner? And why not say, just as some people slanderously claim we do, let us sin that we'll do what is evil so that good may come. Their condemnation is deserved. Um, then he goes on to quote that very famous passage that we use in our gospel presentation. There is none righteous, no, not one. None who understands, none who seeks for God, all have turned away, all alike have become useless. <clears throat> um, we know that whatever the law says speaks to those who are under the law and subject to it. <clears throat> so that every mouth may be shut and the whole world may be subject to God's judgment. <clears throat> I want to move down to... Um, just a few verses in chapter 4 because this is what Galatians, this is what pertains to our, our, our study in Galatians when we come into Galatians chapter 3. His discussion about Abraham and our relationship to him. What can we say then about Abraham, our physical ancestor, our, our father? He is the father of the faith. And what can we say that Abraham found? If Abraham was justified by his works, he's got something to brag about, to boast about, but not before God. Because what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. Genesis 15, 6, you should know that verse. Now to the one who works, the one who works, and we're talking about religious observance, <coughs> Pay is not considered as a gift, but as something owed. When you pick up your paycheck at the end of the week, he ain't giving you a gift. You had a contract. You put in so many hours, and you accomplished so much in those hours, you earn that. And if he don't give it to you, you go into court, and you're going to squeeze it out that company, because they owe it to you. And that is what no man puts God in his debt. God doesn't owe anybody anything for what you do or could do for him. There's nothing you could do that, to give him that he ain't already got. Or that, he, or that he didn't give you in the first place to give back to him. And that includes righteousness. We have none of our own. So we don't, we, it's impossible for a man, religious or otherwise, to put God in his debt. So when you talk about justification before God, we need mercy against the things we've done wrong and transgressed, and we need grace to give us what we never earned or deserved, or, to, or we could never achieve by human effort, and that's sonship, and then all the inheritance rights and uh, gifts that come with sonship. You can't can't earn that you won't deserve it it has to be by grace now Abraham was justified not on the basis of anything he did if he did that and God owed it to him he'd have some bragging rights and, and Abraham did not have bragging rights he glorified God now as to the one who works pay is not considered as a gift but something owed but to the one who does not work now here's where here's where uh, here's where we come in, the church. The one who does not work, we came to Christ here to the Friday night meetings, coming out of the world and out of the out of the streets and sex, drugs, and rock and roll and whatever feels good, do it. <laughs> Why would I deny myself anything that pleasure when I work hard and struggle hard and beat myself up all week long? And what so and 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 when I find myself doing those things, I find myself doing the things that take me away from God and make me everything that God hates and despises. A person who, um, as Paul says, remember those things that you did in the past? Um, you, you were, the, to, that enslaved you and made you its a slave? You had, you, 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 it brought you nothing but shame. And now, uh, this is in uh, 
Romans 6. Yeah. But now you, you have these things. Uh, 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 you have the ability to walk in these things that, that, you, that you used to be ashamed of, but now bring holiness, with, which leads to righteousness. Uh, but the one to him who does not work religiously, but believes on him who declares the ungodly to be righteous just by his declaration, his faith is credited for righteousness. And so David speaks also the blessing of the man who cred God credits righteousness apart from works. How joyful are those whose lawless acts are forgiven and whose sins are covered. How joyful is the man the Lord will never charge with sin. Is this blessing only for the circumcised then? No, it is uh, or also for the uncircumcised. Because when we say faith was credited to Abraham for righteousness, was he, was he credited it while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? No, he wasn't circumcised yet. He was uncircumcised. Circumcised decision came uh, later. He, he received the sign of circumcision later as a seal of the righteousness which he had already had obtained by faith whilst he was, while he was still uncircumcised in the flesh. So uncircumcision doesn't save. It only is an outward representation of an inward reality, just like water baptism. And yet we still have churches today that you're not saved until you're water baptized, thinking that the act itself or the sacrament itself changes a man. And Paul would turn that right upside on. You have just nullified the work of the cross as soon as you bring that in. And if you're going to do that, I wish you'd lock the whole thing off. <laughs> there we go again. All right. So um, Romans 10. So uh, if you will, read Romans uh, 2 through 5 for sure. And... Uh, and then if you want to go into 6, 7, and 8, that'll really climax the story. But as we uh, uh, continue here and pick up in cha Galatians chapter 3, read this section of Romans 2 through 5. It's going to blow up and expand and explain everything Paul's saying to the Galatians. All right. God is good. Nothing like preaching the gospel to yourself. Every day. Every day. All right, folks, we got to pray. Let's close and, uh, and we're heading down stairs this morning. Anybody who want to volunteer? Okay, go ahead. Father, we do thank you for this time that we've had to look into your word. We thank you for your word. And most importantly, we thank you for Lord Jesus Christ and for his grace Lord that none of us deserve but you so freely lavished upon us Lord <clears throat> as we go downstairs to worship you may we worship you in spirit and truth and may you be lifted up and glorified in our midst today and as we yes, Lord. walk this walk this week Lord may you just live your life through us that others could see you in us and be drawn to you for we ask it in Jesus name Amen. Amen.